Welcome to Femme Fatale by Helen. Today, I have an opportunity to talk with Dr. Nicole Jeffari, which she is a faculty of California State University of Department of the Human Development and Child Adolescent Studies. And she also researched an interest in the areas of the cross-cultural and multidisciplinary uh, studies. So doctor, if you, first of all, I wanna say thank you for being here and being part of my show. And if you can a little bit uh, talk about yourself, talk about your expertise and your education so I can introduce you to my audience. Of course. First of all, it's my pleasure to be with you, Helen, and thank you for doing this. It's such a wonderful uh, service that you are offering to our society. And uh, so I'm Nicole Jafari. I have um, I migrated to the United States about 40 some years ago, and not, that just dated me. But let's just forget about that. So, uh, <laughs> That's what just, I always say. Yes, I know. I know. Well, well, who's yeah. adding? Right. Who's adding? Yeah. up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I came to the States uh, for the purpose of um, getting an education like everyone else in my era in the um, early 80s, late 80s, 70s. We came here to the States or Europe. We wanted to get an education, go back home and serve our country, Iran. And I came with that with that idea. Obviously, life had other plans for us because of the, um, the uh, sort of the upheaval of the political situation in Iran. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just uh, it just didn't work out that way. So okay. I did come here to study. I did study. I got a I degree see. in engineering, which was my passion. Oh wow! Okay, absolutely. So wow, and, like uh, that was super. Yeah, exactly. okay. Yeah, my dad was an engineer and I was sort of a, a firstborn by proxy. I'd lost two other siblings to childbirth and uh, oh. early childhood diseases. So I was Sorry, the oldest by proxy. Mm. So I wanted to be an engineer just something like that. And in the late 70s, early 80s, um, um, opportunities for females in Iran were opening up uh, and female engineers were extremely in demand. So I thought I had it all figured out. So I did become an engineer, but I at that time, even other things worked out, such as uh, women in Iran were banned from going to work. So obviously... Right. Uh, decisions were made for me to stay in the States. Mm -hmm. um, so I did become an engineer, a manufacturing engineer in the 80s, mid 80s. And uh, I finished my studies in Chicago, but uh, you know, coming from Tehran, it was a four season Chicago. I opened the folks who know Chicago. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, for sure. In the city. Um, I just couldn't do it. And yeah. uh, this is mid 80s. And I heard mm -hmm. that Los Angeles at that time started to have Persian restaurants and Persian stores and all these Persians yeah. coming. And I said, you know, California, here I come. All right. So so I thought if I can't go to Iran, maybe I can make a living in California. And oh. that's what I do. Makes sense. Okay. I see. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Of course. Yeah. I'm here for the kebab. And you had I the best of the both worlds. You had the freedom of United States, the first world country, and then you were around lots of Iranian people. Absolutely. But, uh, and you know, on top of that, at that time, and I think maybe some folks might think I'm, you know, making this up, but California was a haven for manufacturing, believe it or mm. not. This yeah. is before the era of outsourcing and people, you know, mm. manufacturing moving out of states. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I came here right at the neck of time. So, mm. uh, so I became a manufacturing engineer, loved my job, uh, getting my suit on and going on the factory floor, getting all dirty and wearing my safety shoes and working. I, I can see you one of those badass engineers. Oh, like, I, so sexy. I had all kinds of titles <laughs> for me. Uh, the, the, the workers on the factory floor didn't like me because I would come down and make changes. And they oh, didn't like me. Yeah. Management didn't like me because I was a woman. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, that is true. Yes. This yes. California. Yes. Of course, of nice course. I, I, I feel your pain. So I can't, I mean, I have to write a book and if you want to dedicate a, a whole program to my experience as a female femme fatale yes. uh, in, uh, in a male sort of, a, yeah, it was a male um, field. I was the only engineer in the factory floor and I loved it. I loved being the only one. Uh, but again, uh, years later, 
Mm. Well, when, yeah, 18, 19, 18, 19 years later, I met my husband. I, we decided to get married, had kid, one kid. Life was beautiful. I was traveling because at that time I'd moved up the ladder. Mm. Uh, and then I, I then at the expense of the uh, company, and that's also something in the dreams, no more uh, uh, companies pay for your tuition. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I took advantage of it. I got yeah. my master's in MBA. So I was an MBA with an engineering degree, wow. a female. Wow. Very much wanted. And then we decided to have a second child. And until I hit the glass ceiling. For mm. those folks that don't know what glass ceiling is, uh, this is sort of an invisible uh limit or or, or sort of um like at the end of the line uh, in especially in technology and technical mm -hmm. positions and this is like late 90s by now mm -hmm. uh women uh, started to read the writing on the wall which meant mm -hmm. uh, you i had come to the to the highest level of my career mm -hmm. so the next level for me would have been a vp vice president in some branch and i knew that was never ever 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 gonna happen because i was a female i was a mm -hmm. foreigner and, uh, and this is like 20 years ago which it was way harder way harder than today yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I can unfortunately burst a bubble here. And I say after the glass ceiling, uh, the women that sort of took my footstep, because when I was uh, uh, or follow up in my footstep, because when I was in college in engineering, 300 students and three girls. So mm. as my career in engineering progressed, I witnessed that we had more women in the engineering field mm. and I used to check with universities because it was an interest of mine and yeah. I saw that, uh, the three girls out of a 300 students turned out to be more number of women See. so I guess I uh, the patriarchal uh, male uh, sort of oriented uh, social structure uh, thought of another um, creative way to hold women down and they introduced the glass escalator Hmm. Uh, which meant if you were a minority, uh, they would give you a chance. But if you were a male minority, uh, that's the one who would get the chance. So it's still, uh, you know, uh, you know, we uh, thought we crashed the glass ceiling with sort of sitcoms like uh, Murphy Brown for uh, those of us who are dated like me. Uh -huh. and Murphy Brown sort of tried to break all the taboos. Uh -huh. uh, and there was a sort of a, and I'm talking about America, Iran, you all know what the story is. I mean, mm -hmm. women were forced to go home. But in, in, in Iran, everything is taboo. Is you breathing? Oh, it's taboo. <laughs> you know, and, and a fem, uh, Iranian women are strong. I mean, uh, listen, I was from that stock. You know, I, I mm -hmm. had the female Iranian female blood in me. So I wasn't mm -hmm. going to take anything laying down. But at that time, we decided to have a second child. And I thought, you know what? enough is enough with corporate i'm not going to fight the the glass escalator i'm just going to move on mm. so i stayed home for 2 years to take care of our two young children i thought i could do it for the rest of my life i figured out that this wasn't for me so mm. at that time my boss from my last job black and decker called me and said nicole what does it take to get you back i i never forget that day i walked into his office just to negotiate me coming back after two years. And I wanted to just run away. I, I was done. Mm. So I came home and I, I talked to my husband. I said, I can't do engineering anymore. I, it's mm. just not me anymore. So that's how I switched to other fields. Mm. And I went into developmental psychology and I got my uh, doctorate in uh, education and uh, uh, educational psychology. Wow. Only in America, right? Uh, wow. you can be given opportunities like this True. however women here fought for that opportunity women right. here were given the opportunity to fight for those opportunities so, true. Uh, so this is no um sort of shame on, on the non-western women that they're not doing it it's just right. that women have to be given a, a, right. some sort of a you right. know opportunity or stepping stone I was here at the right time. So for the past uh, 22 years, I've been teaching college, writing textbooks, um, research, and my engineering days are 
behind me, but I have to tell you, my brain now is left brain and right brain all the strength and muscled up. <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. This is really admiring. You know, I, I also like the second part that you were done with it. You yeah. you for a very long time you were so professional at this career and at some point life changed. I'm like, I'm starting all over again. And going all the way to the PhD with psychology, that is lots of work. So it's just like time or age didn't have play any factor in your life. You're like, I want it. I get it. I don't care like how old I am. I don't care where I, what part, which stage of life I'm in. I just want to do this for me. That is very admirable. For you, it's for your kids. I have two daughters and mm. I always felt that I have to role model. Mm -hmm. Not that I expected them to follow in my footsteps. And the only thing I was trying to role model was uh, you never give up. As a matter of fact, in our household, uh, everybody knows the famous um, saying is um, that don't take no for an answer. If somebody says no, just find another way. If you really want it, you have to fight for it. And I have to tell you, I'm I've given you a synopsis of my life and it sounds like, oh, you know, just did that and just did that. No, many, 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 many times I came home and I said, why am I doing this? This is crazy. 100%. I can stay home and raise our kids. I don't have to go back to work. I can just go to get a job at, at the gas station. I mean, those thoughts always. How old were you when you went go back when you went back to school? For my uh, for my PhD for my doctorate yeah for my PhD, yeah, yeah. Um, let me let me count um, yeah 40. Uh, 40. so how old were the no, kids no 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 forty five wow so very I am very admirable and how old were the kids six years old now mm. so okay yeah. and I still got this, a is, lot this is really really powerful because I always see lots of lots of people and they think like oh like you know what I'm 40 it's done it's over I should have done this when I was 20 years old or I should have done when I was in my early 30 but you know the the mentality that teaching society is never too late actually like majority of the entrepreneurs that I'm meeting especially of because of my the podcast or the where I surround myself to meet these type of people they started by 38 40 40 and they build the empire so like the fact that I want to shake people it says hey like trust me is never too late but just go ahead and do it is just a very important factor in your life that you need to pay attention to absolutely well one outlook is if I don't do this what else am I going to do mm -hmm. You know, and then the other outlook of it is, as you also um, mentioned, um, humans go through developmental stages. Correct. You know, when you're younger, these developmental stages are very close to each other, like two, three years, you know, from birth, mm -hmm. and then you go into infancy, and then you go into toddler right. and mm -hmm. preschool and school age, and then pre-adolescent, adolescent, late adolescent, then go, you go into youth, mm -hmm. and, uh, young adults, and late adults, and late, late adults, late, late, late adults, and then, of mm -hmm. course, you know, the inevitable of, of uh, death. But mm -hmm. more and more, science is telling us that uh, getting old is is a state of mind. It is. Um, even now, they're telling us, you know, you're not supposed to lose your teeth when you get older. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to, you know, go blind when you go old. You're not supposed to have aches and pains as you get older. So science is telling us these things, which means this notion of retirement. Uh, first of all, this notion of retirement was something that was introduced in America in 1930s, right after the Great Depression. And it was just to make people stay home so the young people could go to work because we were, you know, facing such a unemployment crisis in America. Yeah. Um, other yeah. than that, there's, there's the notion of retirement, I never understood that. I never mm. sort of could wholeheartedly accept that the fact that um, I just don't use my brain. Now, I have nothing mm. against retirement. My husband, who was younger than me, uh, decided to retire at 55 and he's having a ball. You know, he is so busy. But I can never imagine myself uh, doing that because work is uh, part of my life. So, you know what they say, mm. the famous yeah. thing. 
you love yes. what you do and you don't oh absolutely I, i'll be boring i'll be working two years prior to i'm dying so the last two years right before i die i just want to rest so i can die peacefully okay. i'll be working until the last day That's like the plan. worst thing someone can tell me is like stay home or do nothing like like going to the beach or going to vacation without me like dream without dreaming about my dreams without planning without like like having anything going on I think it's just so pointless and boring to me like I cannot just think the only thing that I have is like nothing or vacation or just there is no productivity there is no creativity like there is no point of my life I think for me I'm not looking forward to it yeah and I'm glad you're saying for me because I certainly don't want to I don't want to advocate that women should do what I'm doing yeah yeah, yeah. I understand that's why I said for me exactly Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, I admire people that can uh, sort of go on, uh, uh, you know, lay on the beach and drink pina colada and and do that for seven days of vacation. I absolutely, I, I'm jealous of them sometimes and say, why can't I just turn off my brain? But I'm very, you know, everybody around me, my family knows, you know, everywhere I go, even vacation. I just came home from a month in Europe, you know, for nice. work and mm -hmm. just just you know, slipping around Europe. <laughs> Nice. Like, God knows my work with uh, went with me. So I contained mm -hmm. myself. I didn't, you know, I was sort mm -hmm. of mindful because uh, my husband and I were traveling. So, but so that that's me. Uh, that's, a, that's a lifestyle that you're choosing. Um, you said something about like the notion of the retirement, which it was a belief system that it was created. And which year you said? This is right after 1920s um, okay. depression, and that was a solution that the United States government came uh, up with. And I believe, because I teach sociology sometimes, I believe they offered uh, people who were in their 60s about uh, $34 a month uh, as an incentive to stay home so that the young people, mm. who had young families could go to work. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to be a temporary uh, solution, but mm -hmm. 10 years later, um, they went and voted became on became a lifestyle, became a belief system. It became, yeah, and it became a, a police system. And they said, okay, now you can retire from 57. Then it, they thought, this is not working, uh, because you know, we're having fewer children now, and, and yeah. if you don't have enough children the population cannot afford to pay into retirement for the next generation so mm -hmm. we ended up thinking this was not a great idea Correct. so um so now they're raising the retirement you know they yeah. say yeah. retire 67 it used to be 63 now it's 65 then 67 and i from i hear through the grapevine that they're trying to make that to 70 so you see even mm. even a solution itself became a problem got it you know, the reason also I brought that subject up is the fact of how someone, how a government, how a society sits there and create a system and then brainwash the population and then we adapt on it and then that becomes our belief system. And then and then whoever believes in that belief system becomes normal and whoever is not following those sets of sets behavior or goals or whatever lifestyle it becomes abnormal so that's another subject that I was going to talk about it because like at any time anyone tells me oh you're supposed to do this or you're supposed to be I don't know have this kind of lifestyle or settle down or like anything with education at this age at 40 years old you should be settling down at 50 years old you should not party as much as you're partying and I'm like who said, who says, who, whose idea was this? Well, I'm supposed to follow up someone else's saying and not make decision for myself. So like, I want you to talk about if it's possible a little bit about belief system and how you look at it and then how you like dissect the word belief system. Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because as you just mentioned, belief system is what uh, constrains people it it sort of it makes you feel and believe that you have no choice 
Mm -hmm. So first of all, all of these we call social construct, which means somebody sat down at some place in time and thought, oh, this is a good idea. Well, we're going to make it fashionable. And then it becomes a trend. Mm -hmm. And look at the history. Every decade we've had a social revolution, some kind of a change that was supposed to be a taboo, for example, mm -hmm. having uh, you know, children out of uh, marriage, uh, or, you know, in the, uh, you know, I referenced uh, Murphy Brown, the sitcom, if anybody's interested. Now, that's a revolutionary thought that created a, uh, a sort of a uh, social war between at uh, that time uh, was uh, the vice president who, whose name um, uh, escapes me. Uh, I'll think of it. Uh, but the vice president of the United States got into the discussion a social media media war with the producers of, of uh, Murphy Brown because Murphy Brown was about, hey, I'm going to go to a sperm bank and I'm going to have a child. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I'm not condoning or, or condemning either one of these ideas, but mm -hmm. if, if, a, if a TV sitcom can have such an impact that at that time, the United States um, vice president um started the social war it means that now they're telling people uh, that let's stick to the old-fashioned way of doing mm. things let's not make any changes and and change this way happens slowly and at a cost so mm -hmm. this is not to say that we should drop all of our moral systems right. but you asked me what belief system is. Belief system is basically sort of at the end tail of what's underneath. So underneath a belief system, as you know, we we sort of refer to sociological theories. Uh, in in sociological theories, belief system happens uh, early on uh, when you're born, and we're born with certain biases, and uh -huh. that is. Game. Not that mm -hmm. our brain has developed biases in the mother's womb, but once we're born with the kind of food, music, uh, language, culture, mm -hmm. we're exposed to the biases start to, to appear. Now, biases by themselves aren't bad. Biases, if they stay at a, at a manageable level, there are preferences, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, taste um, or, or you know, feeling comfortable in a certain way. But unfortunately, because society emphasizes on those biases, they become thought processes. These thought right. processes sort of connect us to our emotions. So if I'm thinking this way, I'm, uh, is, it, is there some kind of an underlying emotion like shame or guilt mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. resentment? So that's where we get in trouble because mm -hmm. now the biases have turned into thought processes that are connected to your emotions. And you say that to yourself enough and other people say that to you enough times, they become your belief system. Mm -hmm. And your belief system then tie into your moral system. Now, this is where we actually get in uh -huh. trouble because when I talk to my clients, I have to remind them of this sort of a um, passage of how mm -hmm. their morality has developed. And I say, check and balance because your morality from throughout your early childhood and then later on, as it was emphasized by society, are based on what your parents told you, what your society, community, uh, and and uh, your upbringing. Mm -hmm. So those become sort of embedded in your morality. And what people don't talk about is that morality is cultural. Mm -hmm. And what is morality? Morality is our belief system, what is wrong and what is yeah. right. Yep. Something that's cultural, it means it really doesn't have a, a strong foundation. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a boyfriend in a Western culture, now when I say Western, I have to say America versus Europe. In mm -hmm. America, you have a boyfriend. Well, you know, they always joke about the father standing behind the front door with a shotgun. You know, don't let your father know. But but kids have boyfriend, girlfriend in America. And nobody gets upset other than these jokes. Yeah. In Europe, it's expected for for um, teenagers to be sexually active because mm -hmm. it's very Freudian, very mm -hmm. sort of traditional in psychology. I work mm -hmm. with European countries a lot, mm -hmm. so I can sort of speak to that. I so see. in Europe, 
Um, teenagers are, are led to be teenagers and sexuality is very uh, is prevalent and accepted. And then we move into the uh, Eastern areas and mm. I'm sure your audience knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The morality is if a girl, especially that, you know, girls are supposed to be virgins, girls are supposed to be Absolutely. pure, a sort of a Virgin Mary persona so what kind of a morality is that when yeah. the foundation is cultural and you know, and I always used to tell my you know ask my mom because I get frustrated I was a fighter always a fighter said if I were born somewhere else this wouldn't be my life that's what they always say I'm like if I was born if I was born in a Jewish family if I was born in a European family if I was born in a Catholic or Mormon family I will completely have different agenda in life different belief system in life so which one is right so like you know when I get challenged with the people that they are trying to convince me how to be normal and I'm like what is that normal like the normal is your illusion of being normal because that normal is only normal in your own dictionary not necessarily that normal is really normal outside because the word outside in the real world it doesn't mean anything it just based on your culture based on your religion based on the country that you were raised with the different philosophy this word is completely a different meaning and so I love what you're saying about. Okay, continue. I would just, I just got too excited. <laughs> well, in developmental psychology, if it makes it any easier for the audience, we mm. always look at what well, we don't look at normal, but we look at um, natural. Is it natural mm. in that age group in that in time setting? Is it natural? But we also we also mention healthy. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for people to sort of not want to always um sort of enforce morality because you know morality is foundationally is is made up right yes. but you really have to look at what's natural and if it's not as you said normal if it's not normal abnormal then uh, you know um clinical psychology will deal with it but if you think a teenager is behaving in a certain way argumentative moody and uh, sort of self-centered the first thing I want to look at is, okay, is this normal within the age group? However, then I have to help this teenager to move on into healthy so that mm -hmm. they learn how mm -hmm. to do complex resolution, how to mm -hmm. sort of present an argument where they can be heard rather than fighting and discussing and uh, sort of disrespectful. So it's very important that we look at uh, the norms and the healthy. Uh, behavior mm -hmm. and, and I, I think that should be the, uh, the, the I like that. level of our morality I like that I like that very deep I'm like it just made me like think about it so much in depth and that healthy is that healthy so like because I'm I want to try to relate it to myself is that healthy is supposed to be healthy for me right it's healthy for me all right. So healthy means how this person can grow to their um, potential, mm -hmm. to their optimized uh, development, and that's healthy for them. Mm -hmm. I see. So then that, that basically uh, we would have as many healthy standards as we have people on the face of the earth, which yes. means you don't compare people to each other. However, right. let's not forget that we live in a rule-based society. We're not talking about rules. We're not talking about individual freedom. We're not talking about democracy. We're talking about people in their own skin mm -hmm. and how they can become the best human being that mm -hmm. potentially they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. sort of like discovering the gem within. So right. discovering the gem within is what the purpose of being mm -hmm. healthy is. For Correct. example, when a two-year-old runs around the house, they take off their pants and everybody laughs and everybody thinks that's that's funny. Mm -hmm. We say that is normal for a two-year-old, but then this two-year-old has to learn that their social constructs are sort of, you know, things that we do and we don't, so that when they're five years of age, they're not doing the same behavior. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. passed their Correct. development. So, uh, sort of range and then they're ready to grow into the next level that's why we say a 40 year old 50 year old 55 year old 60 year old, they have they have different standards of growth all right so i'm saying right. this 
thing, as I was saying at 40, when I'm 65, then it means I haven't really grown into my mm, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. 